Hi, I'm Bill, the Domestic Monk. Welcome back to another video, and thanks very much for watching. So oddly, this is the third video in a row that is, has a movie theme uh, to it. Uh, I promise this isn't turned into uh, some kind of movie review channel. But in this video, I'm going to talk about a recent movie about a real-life Protestant pastor who actually did inspire my own Catholic faith, even though I've never seen the movie. The movie I'm referring to is The Jesus Revolution, which was a pretty big hit in the evangelical community, I'm told. I've never given my full testimony, as our Protestant brothers and sisters call it, in any of my prior videos. I've only referenced certain events in my life or my faith journey which were relevant to the subject of a particular video I was making at the time. In this video, I want to endeavor to tell my true conversion to the Catholic faith, which may sound strange given that I'm a cradle Catholic, and the unlikely circumstances through which one of the primary pastors featured in the Jesus Revolution movie played a big part in confirming me in my Catholic faith. So here it is, my faith journey. I'm a cradle Catholic, and by that I mean I was baptized as a baby and raised in the Catholic faith. My birth parents were divorced when I was about four years old, and my two brothers and I lived with my father and my stepmother, neither of whom practiced the faith. They did, thankfully, make my brothers and I go to Mass on Sunday, but they didn't attend with us. They'd send us off every Sunday morning with our little envelopes full of change for the collection envelope and would walk to church together. I remember we always had to bring a bulletin home to prove that we actually went. And I think this is how my mom uh, kept up with what was going on in the church and anything relevant that uh, she needed to be aware of. Despite not attending Mass with us, I do recall on at least one occasion my father would take us to St. Joseph's Abbey in, in nearby Spencer, Massachusetts, and it was a um, Trappist monastery. And I remember on one occasion, it was a Christmas Eve midnight mass, and what an amazing experience it was. I mean, this was an old stone church with a big organ in it, and the monks came processing in with their robes, hooded robes on, and the entire Mass was sung in Gregorian chant, and it was just an amazing experience, and it's something that I fondly remember to this day. It's probably one of my uh, fondest Catholic memories. My stepmom was ostensibly raised as a Protestant, but I never saw her go to any church service other than the occasional special event at our church, like First Communions and uh, Confirmations. For all intents and purposes, she was and remains to this day an agnostic. They did sign us up to be altar boys, as we were called in those days. And I really love being an altar boy and serving at the Mass, despite having to get up early for the 7 a.m. weekday Masses. I especially like serving at funerals because I got to wave the incense around, which I love the smell of to this day. And we usually got tips. Once I even got a $50 tip working a funeral. And I, I can remember that funeral to this day. I didn't go to Catholic school, which in retrospect may have been a blessing. I know so many people who attended Catholic high schools who either left the faith or have absolutely no concept of the true teachings of the Catholic Church, which I don't understand. My younger brother and I went to public school and attended what we called CCD, which was the religious education of the day. I don't really remember much about it other than we made mobiles and you know artwork and stuff like that. But unlike many Catholics, I don't blame the church for my lack of formation in the faith. I have no doubt that during my religious formation, everything that should have been shared with me was. I just had no interest in it at the time. And quite frankly, we didn't have any spiritual mentorship to speak of at home. When we were really little, we'd say our prayers before bed with my father. And we had a tradition of saying grace before meals. But that honor rotated amongst the three of us and would rattle it off as quick as possible. Other than that, there was no spiritual practice in my home at all. It was a secular upbringing designed to make us productive and law-abiding citizens, not citizens of the kingdom of God. Despite that, and by God's grace, I never lost my faith, however weak and tenuous it may have been at times. I was confirmed at some time in my early teens and recall going to Mass throughout the remainder of high school, if for no other reason than my parents' insistence, for which I'm now very grateful. 
Like a lot of people raised in the Catholic faith, I fell away from participation in the faith almost completely during my time in the army when I had no one compelling me to go to church. And like many Catholics of my generation, I came back to the faith again in my mid-twenties. By that time, I was out of the Army and living in Orange County, California, where I had been hired by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. My older brother was a Marine Corps officer stationed at Camp Pendleton at the time. After graduating from the Sheriff's Academy, we decided to combine our resources and bought a house together at what was then the end of civilization at the north end of Mission Viejo. And one day my brother came home from work and he told me, I found the perfect church. There's no singing, no holding hands, and you're in and out in 30 minutes. That church was St. Killian in Mission Viejo. And little did I know that it would be my spiritual home for the next 35 years. My wife went through RCIA uh, there when we were engaged. We went through marriage prep there. We got married there. And all four of my children were baptized and confirmed there. My wife was baptized and confirmed in the Greek Orthodox faith as a baby, but she was raised only nominally Christian. She was raised by her mom, who was not religious at all, and she had no real Christian formation to speak of. She, she agreed to become Catholic, but really hoped she could drag me off to some evangelical church for about the first 25 years of our marriage. And several of my closest friends, both then and now, have been raised or baptized Catholic, and others were involved in the local uh, Protestant evangelical sects and tried to lead us out of the church like they had been. Most notably to the Calvary Chapel, which is the church that Chuck Smith, one of the pastors featured in the Jesus Revolution movie, was based on. And Rick Warren's Saddleback Church, which at the time was just starting out. It was located about two streets down from our house. Um, they would, at that time, they were... Uh, sharing space with Tribuca Hills High School on the corner down there. And that was long before they became the uh, mega church they are today. My wife tried to get me to go to Saddleback Church for many years. <laughs> but I always felt at home in the Catholic Church. And despite not knowing my faith very well, I never even considered going to one of these other churches. Prior to that time in my life, I knew very little about uh, differences in so-called Christian faith traditions. Religion was not something that ever came up among my friends until we all started retur to return to the faith as we matured in life. I knew there were Protestant churches, of course, and generally about the Reformation that caused them, but I didn't know the objections and, quite frankly, the hostility many Protestants harbor toward the Catholic Church. In discussions with friends during that time period, I began to be exposed to the usual Protestant objections, even though I didn't know that they were the usual Protestant objections at the time. And that was an eye-opener for me. It led me realizing that while I was comfortable in a Catholic church and felt at home there, I came to understand that I didn't know my faith well enough to explain it to others, never mind defending it from attack. And that's where God's grace led me on a journey of exploration and knowledge of the faith and its origins. And unlike many uh, poorly formed Catholics, including many of my friends who left the church for these Protestant churches they were all advocating for, I wasn't in all, at all enticed by the Protestant criticisms of the Catholic church. In fact, I was very skeptical of them, despite how appealing they may have sounded on the surface. I did know at least that Jesus started the Catholic Church that had been around for 2,000 plus years and that countless souls have been faithful to her over those two centuries. I also knew at least superficially about the great saints of the church, like St. Joseph, my own patron saint, and the long line of martyrs for the faith. I knew there had to be some reason that these great holy men and women spanning the centuries were willing to sacrifice life and limb for this church that many of my friends denounced as illegitimate, if not downright evil. I decided that before I would set foot in a Protestant church, I would make at least an effort to find out what those reasons were and what an adventure that turned out to be. So back to Chuck Smith, the Jesus Revolution pastor and his influence on my own personal faith journey. At that time, in the late 80s and early 90s, he hosted a radio show called To Every Man an Answer. It was a call-in radio show, and mostly he took questions and gave his opinions about Scripture, which for someone theologically and scripturally illiterate like me at the time, I found pretty interesting. 
I have no doubt they're filled with many Protestant errors, which I was unfamiliar with at the time, but I was hungry to learn more about Scripture. But at least once a show, he would launch into an anti-Catholic tirade. Chuck Smith was a dyed-in-the-wool anti-Catholic. There's no other way to say it. Someone would call in with a question about the Catholic faith, and he would launch into a tirade denouncing Catholic beliefs on everything from the veneration of Mary and the saints to purgatory to the wearing of sacramentals, like the St. Michael medal I wore at the time, who is, of course, the patron saint of police officers. And this guy spoke like he was Moses himself. He had a self-assuredness that came across to me anyway as arrogant. For me personally, I found his message off-putting, and I was never drawn in by it in the least. And it actually frustrated me, really, because frank, quite frankly, I knew inherently that the way Catholics worshipped wasn't wrong or anti-Christian, as he inserted, but I simply didn't know enough to refute him. And that is exactly what a guy like Chuck Smith depended upon. Now, one of my worldly strengths, and admittedly one of my greatest spiritual weaknesses, is that I love a good fight, and there was no way I was going to take this stuff laying down. I knew, for instance, that the Bible, which Chuck Smith claimed to be a superior authority than the Catholic Church, was in fact a byproduct of that church. I knew Jesus didn't leave us a Bible. He left us a church. And it was this knowledge that prevented me from being drawn into what I inherently understood to be a flawed theology. But that didn't stop me from listening to him. I just started listening with a critical eye. And I turned his anti-Catholic tirades into challenges, personal challenges, to go and find out what the church really taught about these things and why. And that's when the scales fell from my eyes. I found out very quickly that this church, the one founded by Christ, was the same church described in Matthew 16, 18 through 19. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That he vested that church with his authority to teach and preach in his name and assured them of his protection of that church as history, tradition, and scripture all verify. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We call this the Great Commission. I learned very quickly that people like Chuck Smith imposed their own authority upon the church and interpreted scripture according to their own will not the will of the church Jesus gave that authority to. And I discovered that this church was a treasure trove of information available for anyone to seek and find. I began looking for resources to learn what the church actually taught and has taught consistently for 2,000 years, long before Chuck Smith and any of these other Johnny-come-lately evangelical churches came along. One of the first real treasures I found was a series of books called Radio Replies, which ironically were the transcripts of a Catholic call-in radio show hosted by two Catholic priests in the 1960s. There were three original volumes which I bought and immersed myself in. There's now one volume containing the best of all three that's available today, and I highly recommend it. If you want a no-nonsense defense of what the church really teaches and why, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I also bought a number of good Catholic apologetic books, like one of my favorites is Hilaire Belloc. You know, I got the, the Great Heresies, How the Reformation Happened, and several other books that are over here in my library. Next, I found Catholic Answers, a contemporary Catholic version of Chuck Smith radio show, which taught Catholic doctrine in an easy and straightforward way. And that's when I really started learning my faith. I listened to it as often as I could. At that time, I used to download MP3s into my iPod, and then I would listen to it when I was driving, or working out, or working in the yard, or whenever I had the opportunity. Keep in mind, this is in the late 80s and early 90s, long before I'd ever heard of Scott Hahn, or Bishop Robert Barron, and many of the other Catholic apologists that are so popular today. 
I was literally groping in the dark for information. Another gold mine for me was the writings of the early church. Many Protestants like Chuck Smith act like the church came into existence with Martin Luther in the 16th century. In order to hold that view, you have to ignore the large body of work produced by the church and her saints and scholars for the previous 1,500 years. Some of these which were so impactful to me include the Didache from the late 1st or early 2nd century. It's also called the Teaching of the Apostles and known as the First Catechism, which includes historical verification of baptism, confession, and the Eucharist. The writings of Catholic apologists from the early church, like the first apology of St. Justin Martyr. He wrote in the early 2nd century, and it's considered the first work of Christian apologetics, where he gives a detailed description of the Mass, which is so re remarkably consistent with the Mass we celebrate to this day, it's almost hard to believe. And he also describes in depth the sacrament of the Eucharist. The letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, which I've talked about numerous times on this channel. He's also from the early 2nd century. And while he was on his way to Rome to be martyred for the faith, in his letter to the Smyrnians, he not only describes in detail the authority of the church, he also warns against schism and is the first to use the term Catholic to refer to her. Where the bishop is present, there let the congregation gather. Just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Without the bishop's supervision, no baptisms or love feasts, which is what they called the Mass at the time, are permitted. On the other hand, whatever he approves pleases God as well. And that way, everything you do will be on the safe side and valid. And St. Polycarp's letter to the Ephesians, he also wrote in the mid-2nd century. While Chuck Smith denounced the Catholic practice of veneration of the saints, Polycarp commands us to pray for all the saints. And St. Irenaeus, who wrote in the second century and against heresies, condemned the heresy of Gnosticism and affirmed the apostolic tradition and authority of the Catholic Church. St. Cyprian's The Unity of the Catholic Church, which was written in the third century, also wrote about the authority of the Catholic Church and the primacy of St. Peter as its head. The writings of St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century was another one of the early church fathers and is one of the most important sources for how the early church celebrated the Mass and administered the sacraments in the first few decades after Christianity was legalized. You cannot read these writings and not see the Catholic Church. They have to be literally ignored to arrive at the theology of someone like Chuck Smith. And so does 2,000 years of history and tradition of the church. Another one of my favorite Catholic saints and apologists is St. Francis de Sales, whose book, The Catholic Controversy, A Defense of the Faith, is a collection of tracts he wrote and distributed during and in response to the Protestant revolt while a young priest serving in Geneva, Switzerland. At that time, this was hostile Calvinist territory. This work resulted in the reconversion of 72,000 Calvinists within a five-year period and earned him the title Apostle to the Calvinists. Like Radio Replies, St. Francis de Sales' defense of the faith remains just as relevant today against the stubborn but false beliefs still held by modern Protestants. The Catholic Church has been around for 2,000 years. Every period of it has been documented and preserved. You cannot read these writings and not see the thread that runs down between them and throughout that 2,000-year history. It was clear to me after learning about her that the Catholic Church is the one they are defending and no other. I was greatly surprised by what I learned, although I shouldn't have been. And it not only confirmed me in my faith, it left me wondering how somebody like Chuck Smith could lead so many people astray. I learned very quickly that all the things Chuck Smith denounced in the Catholic Church were not only erroneous, they grossly misrepresented the true meaning of Scripture and showed a complete disregard for the history and sacred tradition of the Church. I learned where this thing we call the Bible came from. It wasn't dropped here out of the blue. Nobody went up a mountain and came down with the Bible like Moses did with the Ten Commandments. 
Jesus didn't write the Bible. In fact, for all we know, he never wrote anything beyond whatever it was he wrote in the sand at the foot of the woman accused of adultery. What Jesus did do, and this is irrefutable from scripture, tradition, and history, is found a church. One church. It was that church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, founded on the rock of St. Peter, and invested with Jesus' authority to teach and preach in his name to all nations and all generations. And it was that church that he promised to protect until the end of the age. We know the end of the age wasn't the end of the apostolic age, or when Constantine made Christianity legal, or when Constantine actually became a Christian, which happened at two very distinct times in his life, by the way. Or when Luther revolted against the church and created his own in opposition to it, or any of the other excuses offered by those who continue to object to the Catholic Church and her teaching. All of these things were predicted by Jesus himself and only served to further confirm the validity of his one true church. And I've never stopped trying to learn about our great faith. It is so rich and diverse that you can't learn it all, but making the effort is so rewarding. As a police officer, you used to carry copies of the Penal Code and the Vehicle Code, the Health and Safety Code, the Business and Profession Code. We carried all of those around in the trunks of our cars. Because like the Catholic Church, which contains a treasure trove of information, the laws we needed to be familiar with out there were too numerous to commit to memory. Sure, we knew many of the common ones that we encountered on a daily basis, like theft and drunk driving, assault, uh, the various common drug violations. But others we needed to take the time to stop and look up in the applicable code to make sure they applied to the situation we were confronted with at the time. Our faith is no different. If you want to effectively defend the faith, the scripture passages and dogmas we know by heart are dwarfed by those we're going to be confronted with. But this isn't any cause for concern. All of this information is available on your cell phone today. There are so many good Catholic resources available today online that it's inexcusable for us to remain ignorant of the faith we possess. Some of the ones that continue to be helpful to me include a daily radio show on EWTN called Call to Communion. The host, Dr. David Anders, is a convert from Pentecostalism, and he's got a knack for explaining almost any aspect of the faith simply and clearly. I listen to him so much I feel like I have a degree in Dr. Andersism. Another fantastic uh, radio resources, Cresta in the Afternoon. It's also available on EWTN and Ave Maria Radio. It's the best Catholic talk show I've ever heard. He presents information about every aspect of the Catholic faith, from church history, the lives of the saints, theology, Catholic literature, you name it. Al Cresta is truly a blessing to the Catholic faith and an invaluable resource for someone wanting to learn more about it. You can also easily access excellent homilies from priests all around the world. So if your parish priest's homilies don't necessarily inspire you, which, which mine doesn't, there are a multitude of others available who will. For me, Father Mark Gorin's YouTube channel is one of those. Another one is Our Lady of the Gulf Catholic Church's YouTube channel, which I rarely miss. Father Michael O'Connor, Father James Smith, and Deacon Mike Harris are all excellent homilists. And there are other more popular resources like Bishop Robert Barron's Word on Fire Ministry, Father Mike Schmidt's Bible and Catechism in a Year podcasts, Trent Horn's Council of Trent podcast, which is specifically geared towards apologetics, just to name a few. The opportunities for learning about our faith, its history, the lives of the great saints, Catholic prayer and devotional practices is nearly limitless. We all have different interests and preferences, and we're all at different places in our own faith lives. What appeals to me may not appeal to you, but I encourage you to seek and you will find the ones who do. That I guarantee. It just takes a little effort on your part. But it's all there for anyone truly seeking it, and it's more readily available than ever before. For me, it exposed Protestant theology is weak and thin by comparison. It's the theology of man. Every position the Protestant Church takes that conflicts with the teachings of the Catholic Church was formulated by man for man. 
Arian, Luther, Calvin, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, all of them created faith systems of their own, on their own authority. None of them are the church foretold by the prophet Daniel 400 years before the advent of Christ. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Daniel 2.44-45 There is only one institution in existence today which meets that criteria, the Catholic Church. It has lasted longer than any other earthly empire, including the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the British, and it will undoubtedly outlast the United States. There's no need to shirk from it. We should root ourselves firmly in it, knowing that it has the protection of the God of heaven and earth, and that the gates of hell will never prevail against it, try as they might. The real Jesus revolution started 2,000 years ago. It's as alive today as it was then, passed on from generation to generation through the lives of the saints, the sacrifice of the martyrs, and the teachings of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So thanks for listening to my faith journey. No doubt yours will be different based on your own unique life and circumstances. But I can assure you it will prove to be as exciting and transformative for you as mine was for me. All you need to do is get started. That's why as Catholics we need to learn our faith, love our faith, and live our faith. So we can share the true faith, the pearl of great price given to us by Jesus himself with those we know and love. There is nothing greater we can do than that. I hope you enjoyed this video and my conversion story. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment about the thing that confirmed you and your faith. So thanks very much for watching. And as always, siempre adelante.